came back to MIT, and other than spending a year in Japan on sabbatical, I've been here ever since. So what's that, 40, 44 years minus three, anyway. Um, I've been here in Boston 10 years. So I first did a PhD in course three. And Tell him your name. Simon Belmar. Yeah, Dr. Simon Belmar. Yeah. He's, he's, he's also teaching part of this course. Um, so I, I worked for five years in industry in a big company, and I more like started my own and more involved with the activity on campus. Okay. And uh, Dr. Belmar uh, did his thesis on fatigue and fracture, which is part of what he'll be lecturing on here. Um, let me just talk a little bit about, today is just an introductory lecture. And I teach this course in a unconventional MIT way. But I don't like the way we teach our other courses. But I only have 41 years of experience here as both an undergraduate, graduate student, and a faculty member. But I think that qualifies me to say I don't like the way MIT teaches, or any other college so far as that goes, for a number of reasons. Um, particularly at the senior graduate student level. You know, when I'm teaching freshmen or sophomores, I have to give them problem sets so that I can grade their problem sets so that I can distinguish whether they're an A student, a B student, or a C student. And from my point of view, it's a pain in the neck, okay? It has no redeeming social value, particularly five years once you're out of school, okay? No one, you know how many times anyone's ever asked me what my undergraduate cum was? Once in 40 years, okay? Someone ever cared about what it was. Um, and I've talked to other people and they've said, zero, okay? The only thing that your undergraduate cum or your graduate cum is good for, well, your undergraduate cum is good for your getting into the next school if you're going to graduate school. Your graduate cum is basically good for next to nothing other than getting out of graduate school, okay? And that's why these things have no redeeming social value. So I don't, for the last 15 or 20 years, I've, I've taught a course, actually for 25 years, I've taught a course on welding and joining, which is what I got my tenure on. And then I kind of switched over to more generally manufacturing. Um, and I've taught this course or a version of this course on welding and joining for 25 years and I've only given out three grades. A's, F's, and incompletes. Okay? Uh, so don't worry about your grade because it really is worthless. Okay? Other than, hey, you know. I would much rather teach um, older, more mature students who want to learn and I'm not going to make you do lots of busy work. Okay? because I hated busy work as a student. I hated problem sets. I thought they were a total waste of time. They were completely contrived. Think about it, a problem set, the, the professors always give you just the right amount of information. No more and no less. So back 25 years ago, I was teaching sophomores thermodynamics, and I started giving them either too much information or not enough information. And the students went berserk. Okay? Because you got to come to MIT because you learned how to take all the pieces of the puzzle and make the problem work. Because everyone gave you a full deck. No more, no less. And when I threw the students a curve by giving them more or less, they didn't know how to solve the problem. Okay? And so at that point, 25 years ago, I decided there's something wrong with the way problem sets. Okay? That's not the real world. Your boss doesn't give you all the pieces of a problem and say, go solve this problem. In fact, your boss may give you a problem, and if you're a materials engineer, he may give you a civil engineering problem, or he may give you an accounting problem. And guess what? You have to go solve that problem. In fact, uh, when I was department head, I used to teach the sophomores in the department how to find a job. Does anybody know why someone hires you? Give me a sound bite on why someone would hire you. Someone hires you because they think you will help them solve their problems. Okay? They're not hiring you because they think that this is a good thing to do for social welfare is to give you a paycheck every week. They're willing to part with some of their hard earned cash because they have problems and they want you to contribute to that. And that means 
The corollary to that is you never bring a problem to your boss. You only bring solutions to your boss, whoever your boss is. They're going to hire you because you can help them solve their problems, and what do they want? They don't want you to come and bring them problems. They want you to solve problems. So now you may not know what the solution is, but you're MIT students. You ought to be able to figure out two or three good solutions. And if you're smart, you'll present all three to your boss in the proper order so that only an idiot wouldn't choose the right one. Okay, this is how you manage your boss. Anyway, those are the types of things you need to think about in your education. Frankly, I'm not interested in math. I've sat in faculty meetings for 35 years and not, not since three weeks ago or two weeks ago did I sit in a faculty meeting where the faculty were complaining that the students don't have, they're not good enough in their math abilities. And I've always said, are you kidding me? Half the MIT undergraduates got 800s on their math achievement tests. Okay? I thought I was a big deal when I came here. I was the only student in my high school who got an 800 on anything. I got an 800 on my math SAT. Only student in my high school in Virginia Beach who got 800 on anything. And I came to MIT and the first day over in Crescent Auditorium, they showed us a profile of the class and I found that a third of my class had 800s. So that sort of put me in my place, right? And I very quickly learned that although you were great in your high school and you learned to compare yourself with others on academics because you would win most of the time, when you come to MIT, the problem is, on average, you're average. And so you have to learn a whole new way of thinking of things and, and stuff. So I actually took about 30-some years of MIT experience a few years ago and wrote an article for the faculty newsletter. Now, the reason I wrote this article was because I didn't want Bob Brown, who was the provost and former dean of engineering, head of chemical engineering, and we had served on engineering council together, he had become provost at MIT, and I did not want him to become president of MIT. Okay? He's now president of Boston University. And when he left MIT, he didn't get president. Susan Hockfield was selected as president. And when Bob left to become president of Boston University, I sent him an email said, bye, B-Y-E. Jerk. Anyway, and now, as I said, Boston University's loss was our gain. Uh, so I wrote this article on leadership management and education at MIT, which actually was about the result of 12 years of thinking, after I'd been here for 20 some years, in the early 90s, I started thinking, what makes MIT unique? And there's a number of things that make MIT unique, and I wrote this article about it. I also talked about the difference between leaders and managers. One of the things I learned back in the late 80s when I took a, a Sloan program for senior executives over at the Sloan School was, you have to learn to communicate. And to communicate in this world, you have to speak in sound bites. Okay? Some people talk, the elevator talk, too long. You gotta be able to do sound bites. And the sound bite for leadership and management for, that I came up with, a leader seeks to help others, a manager seeks to control others. Okay? And so now, I can pick out, in the first couple of minutes in the meeting, whether this person is a control freak, and therefore a manager, or whether this person is actually there to be helpful, okay? And as a result, I'm now completely cynical about the leadership of MIT, which is composed of a bunch of managers who want to control people, okay? Nonetheless, this has not much to do with materials processing. Um, but in fact, I'd rather talk about some of those things because I actually look at the courses that I teach as not a course in welding or joining or sheet metal forming or casting or whatever, but to try to tell you stories you will remember, but also to give you a few ideas of things that I've learned over 40 years at MIT that I wish someone had told me when I was your age. Not you, Carl. Your age is closer to mine now. Okay, but, but nonetheless, I wish people had told me why someone hired you, okay? Because they want you to help you solve the problem. If you have those fundamental principles, you'll know you're smart enough, in spite of what MIT teaches you, that you're stupid, okay? And that's part of my article here. One of the things we tell the students is they're average or below average. Well, you're not, let me tell you. You go out there in the real world and very quickly you relearn that you're above average, 
Okay, anybody experienced that yet? Learning that MIT told you you were stupid and then going out in the real world and finding you're not necessarily more stupid than anyone else. In fact, you might even be smarter than some of the other people. And you will actually be successful someday. But one of the problems of this place is the people who graduate from MIT have less self-esteem than the people who entered MIT. And they're the same people just four years apart. And I consider that to be one of the great disservices of the MIT education to teach you that you are not as good as you really are. One of the great services of the MIT education is to teach you humility. And that's actually teaching the same thing. So one of the great disservices is also one of the great services. So that's in that article. You can read that article. You won't be quizzed on it except every day of your life. Okay? Yeah, but no one's going to grade you on it. Okay? So that's why I hand that out for whatever that's worth. Now what is this course about? Well, this course started out when I got back from my sabbatical in Japan in 1985. I had gotten tenure and I now had sort of earned the right to be able to teach my research subject, which was welding and joining. So I started teaching this course and I kind of, you know, did it in the not exactly the tra traditional MIT way, but mostly the traditional MIT way. And then over in the six or seven years later, we started the program called Leaders for Manufacturing. Now it's Leaders for Global Operations. It's joint with the Sloan School. And I started focusing more not just on welding journal joining, but manufacturing in general. And um, I have always worked a lot with industry, more than the average MIT faculty, so I had stories to tell. And that's what st students always talk about when they talk about my courses. They remember the stories, okay? So you're gonna hear some stories today um, and every day that I'm lecturing. But what happened about a year and a half ago, Chris Hsu, who's now the department head, but at the time he was chairman of the graduate committee, he came to me and said, Tom, uh, the department wants you to have more face time with the students um, and we want you to teach more than just welding and joining. We want you to teach solidification and you know whatever you want. We need more courses in metallurgy and in materials processing. So I said, okay, but the only way I can do this is to do it in my approach to things uh, because I'm just as busy as you are. And my schedule is not nice and easy Monday, Wednesday, Friday at nine o'clock or Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11, okay? Um, and so what I, what I had been doing for years with my welding course is I would teach the course every single day that I was in town. And in the fall, we would finish by Halloween. Okay? So that's what we're going to do in here. I'm going to teach a third of this course live. Dr. Belmar is going to teach a third of this course live. I'm going to tell you what we're going to teach. You're going to watch another third by video of me lecturing last summer to a bunch of Navy officers, okay, who were here in Course 2 at, at, at MIT. Um, and the first module, which is probably the last one you'll do, is basically an introduction, introduction to materials processing. And you actually have an opportunity, Jerry, Jeremy in the back um, with the video camera is actually taking the course, just like you but he's earning a little money on the side because he's gonna be here videotaping for the future, okay? I'm only gonna, it will be three years before I teach my, my part of this, my third of this again. I'll tell you, I'll warn you that it's been 30 years since I taught this subject of deformation processing, but, and, and the book that I learned from, the book I taught from 30 some years ago is out of print. The good news is I found a substitute that's almost almost the same, uh, but I'll, we'll go through that later. Um, Dr. Belmar is going to teach you about structural life assessment because really I'm supposed to be t teaching an introduction to materials processing, but the introduction to materials processing that I teach is structural materials. So if you're a civil engineer, you're probably not interested in how to make a semiconductor chip, right? Neither am I, okay? If you're um, a nuclear engineer, well, you may be interested in semiconductor chips, but you may not care about how they're made. In fact, civil engineers, too, might be interested in using them. 
but you're probably more interested in some structural materials. You might be interested in corrosion. You might be interested in welding. Uh, but my goal is to come up with about nine or ten modules that students can take three modules at a time. And in fact, if nobody wants to come to class this semester but you want to get credit, you could take three modules of the four that already exist. And the four that already exist are um, one is the intro to materials processing and a sort of descriptive thing on casting of metals. That was the one I did put together last summer when Professor Shu asked me to do things. There's another one on, um, I'll call it joining technology. And I've been teaching some version of this for 25 years. Starting to get used to it now. The next one is on fusion welding. I've been teaching that for about 25 years. And the other one is sort of a mishmash of materials selection Non-destructive testing, non-destructive, yeah, non I'll call it non-destructive testing techniques, uh, welding, metallurgy, and fracture mechanics. So these two modules, about 12 hours of lectures, e all, all of these are about 12, 13 hours of lectures each, hour being a 50 minute hour. Uh, these two go back 25 years. They've been modified. More stories than I used to have. This one started about 15 years ago when Professor Masabuchi retired and the Navy students had certain things like welding metallurgy that I was not covering because he had been covering it for 25 years. But when he retired, the Naval Sea Systems Command wanted them to learn welding metallurgy so they said, well you add that to your course and I said, well you know what I'll do. The students need to learn something about material selection, so I'm going to teach you about something about material selection. And you know, no one around here tells you how to go out and test something, X-rays, magnetic particle. So I think they need. To, I think these Navy guides need to know what's going on because they use it every day. So I uh, I uh, added that and the welding metallurgy they wanted and fracture mechanics. I've never thought that. Fracture mechanics is a typical MIT subject where they teach you all the theory and never any of the use, practical use of the product. Okay, but this handout is a well, let's see, let me pass around that way. This handout, materials research needs for the 21st century defense needs. I served on a committee of the National uh, Research Council, and we were supposed to look at. This was probably around 2000 or 2002 or something. We were supposed to look at how the Defense Department was going to figure out what they needed to do in materials research for the next 20 years or 25 years. Sorry, yep. Oh, sorry. Let me. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that. When I get. Okay. So. Now. I had some sort of unconventional things, so I wrote up. I wrote up my chapter. And they decided it was so useless that they made it an Appendix C, okay? Because it didn't fit in everything else that was in the report. So they made it Appendix C. This is about 10 years of my thinking about what really controls material selection. And one of the most important things, um, actually I can tell you an anecdotal sto story. Um, a, a year or two before me, Professor Joel Clark became a faculty member in this department. And Joel was unique at the time. This was 40 years ago, nearly 40 years ago. And that he had both a PhD from this department, where he'd studied the structure of magnesium cadmium alloys. What use is that? Okay. Um, but he also had an MBA from the Sloan School. And he was hired to look at the economics of materials and material substitution. Well, 40 years ago, that wasn't such a hot topic, but Joel was hired to pioneer that area. And he has, okay? Um, and I was walking across campus about 20 years ago, 
and met up with another faculty member who's very prominent in the department, full professor now, and he was a young faculty member at the time. He says, did you see Professor Clark's article in the Journal of Metals? And I said, uh, yeah. He said, well, you know, I never thought about it before, but cost really is important, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Ooh. This is a rocket scientist MIT professor who had just learned. Now, this person now is worth tens of millions of dollars and has started one of the most successful companies in the department. And I bet you he's learned more about the importance of cost. Okay? But at the time, this was a great revelation to him. Well, if you want to know something about material selection, and this is actually going to be in this, this module that I'm proposing that all of you watch this video as opposed to some others. Um, I actually give you one of the keys. And one of the keys is, does anybody know what the value of a pound of weight saved in an automobile is? It's in this article so you can read it. It's about two dollars a pound over the life of the vehicle. If you can take a pound out of the car over the next hundred thousand miles you'll save two dollars in gasoline. Okay, if you look at things. Some people argue it's two dollars and fifty cents, who cares? Anybody know what it is for an airplane, if you're Boeing? 200. 200, very good. Have you heard this before? Mm -hmm. uh, huh? <laughs> last what? semester. Oh, last semester, okay. <laughs> you should have. Anybody know what it is for a spacecraft? $20,000 a pound is about what it costs to get up into orbit. The space shuttle in, in late 1960s was supposed to lower the price of payload into orbit from $10,000 a pound to $1,000 a pound. And how successful was the space shuttle? Well, it upped the price to about $300,000 a pound because they had a few problems with the space shuttle, but that's another story. So it actually didn't meet its goal, but there was the X-33 space plane that was supposed to bring us back and have a re reusable space shuttle, basically. And it had problems, and we could talk about that. Some of these other lectures will tell you some of those stories about some why those, some of those things didn't work. But nonetheless, you have to decide, getting back to the introduction to this course, you have to decide what modules you want to take. I'm going to give one on deformation processing, which is sort of extrusion and forging and sheet metal forming and wire drawing and coining. Deformation processing is what Al Back often called it. And Al was the faculty member in the department, first person I worked for as a sophomore. It's not very good focus, but anyway. So he wrote this book, and I took his course. He had been teaching it for probably 15 or 20 years, and I took it, I think, about the time the book came out in 1972 or so. I didn't have a clue what he was talking about when I took the course, just like you don't have a clue about what most people, I mean, anyway. I've taken courses too, okay. I started to learn it the first few years as a faculty member, I was teaching out of that book. I have gone back to that book about every two months for the last 40 years for some of the concepts that are in that book. There's another professor who taught solidification and I actually helped edit his book before it came out. This book, Deformation Processing, is out of print. You can buy it on Amazon used for about 80 bucks. The other professor's book on solidification, you can buy it, it's out of print too. You can buy it on Amazon for 800. Okay. I didn't pull that solidification book off the shelf until last summer when I was teaching solidification. That's how useful I found the concept. Well, I knew some of the concepts, but I didn't have to go back to it. But you know, this is a great book. This has really helped me on a semi-monthly basis over the last 40 years. So I like the stuff in here. And I'm going to try to teach you some of it. But the problem is, it's out of print. So I was going to have to copy things and stuff. Fortunately, there's a guy named Bill Hosford, who was one of Backoffen students back in the 60s, did a PhD with him. He went off to Michigan, became a professor, and he wrote a book called Metal Forming. It's not as broad as, metal, as deformation processing. It's a little easier to understand, actually, because Backoffen is so dense. Back often required his PhD students to condense their theses down to 30 pages. It would typically take the student, after they finished all their research, another year to finish writing and condensing the ideas to 30 pages. 
and they would come in and they pr present you know the hundred page thing and this is before word processors folks where they had had it all typed up and gave it to them and they come in a couple days later and he would curse them and throw the throw the manuscript at them and tell them get out of here until they came back and wrote something decent and that was the advice he gave to his students come back when you've written something decent so he wasn't loved by many of his doctoral students um, in fact he was hated by most of them but nonetheless by forcing them to condense things down to their essence that book is the densest book I've ever read on engineering there are more concepts in there but I'm not going to make you learn from that we have Bill Hosford's third edition well actually we have Bill Hosford's fourth edition 83 bucks on Amazon 2007 copyright 2011 copyright he's added two chapters to the fourth edition from the third edition the principles haven't changed that much 695 at Amazon a month ago until I bought enough copies they raised the price to 15 but I bought enough copies so that you all get a present from me okay here's your third edition copy fire sale what happened was good old Bill Hosford in his retirement is pumping out extra editions so they over over printed the third edition <coughs> and so now you now have a textbook for my third okay um, if you didn't get enough I got more up here but I'm not buying them at 15 bucks okay you can buy your own at 15 next year's three years from now the class will maybe maybe will pump out a fifth edition I can buy the fourth editions cheap nonetheless the problem is if you pub publish a book don't don't surprise your publisher by coming out with another edition four years later just because you want to make money so we had to order Amazon wouldn't let us order more than nine at a time but we put in three or four orders did everyone get one anyway anyone not have one okay okay um, so we will use Hosford's book in place of back off its book but I just want you to know and maybe I'll even look at the fourth edition sometime again um, I want you to know what I'm really going to be working from is back off its book if you want to buy it you can you don't need to buy it because you're not going to be quizzed on it I'll also be working on some other books because Here's one by Tylen Alton, who's a professor at Ohio State. He wrote a book on cold and hot foraging. Here's one by someone from Italy who wrote a book on super plastic forming. Okay? Anybody from the aerospace industry know anything about super plastic forming? We couldn't build in jet engines today unless we had super plastic forming. Who discovered super plastic forming? Well, super plasticity was discovered, some people say, if you read that book, people had discovered this process back around 1900 they take a tensile specimen and anybody know how much elongation you get in a tensile specimen when you pull it approximately a piece of steel no idea take a guess a few, a few percent. 30 percent it's typical elongation okay a brittle material is usually less than a fairly brittle material is less than five percent you don't like to design structural things with less than five percent ductility you like to have more than ten percent average steel is thirty percent really good steel really clean steel forty percent super plasticity we'll talk about it four hundred percent and what was happening was professor Backhoff and in the sixties was looking at the effects of fine grain size Professor Grant was looking at the effects of no grain size or very large grains because he was a high temperature materials person. He was the person looking at things like turbine blades for jet engines. This turbine blade goes back 20 years. It's a single crystal. No grain boundaries. Grain boundaries destroy, destroy the creep high temperature properties. The grain boundaries are like butter and they just thing just slides into forms. We spend, if this was a good blade, be worth about six or seven thousand dollars and there's a hundred of them on every wheel of every engine okay every turbine engine that's why the engines cost five or ten million bucks anyway so Grant was looking at how to get rid of grain boundaries in structural materials for high temperature properties 
back off and was going in the opposite direction, looking at how to get the very fine grain size and what happened, how things deformed. And we'll talk about that, but back off and rediscovered superplasticity. At the time, he found a 1938 paper from Germany where they'd measured superplasticity with very fine grain material. Because of World War II, it got lost. It wasn't until the early 60s that Backhoff and rediscovered it. I will bring in some of the samples, Backhoff's original samples. Because I was, you know the short little door, 8137, as you walked out around the corner from the Infinite Quarter? That was my first office. I shared it as an assistant professor with Backhoff's last doctoral students. And I picked up many of his samples. So when I teach deformation processing, you're going to see Al back off in samples, his touchy feelies to pass around the room. Uh, and I, these, I always tell students, these superplasticity samples should be in the Smithsonian. But superplasticity is something that, um, like I say, we couldn't build jet engines without superplasticity. Okay. Invented here at not invented here at MIT, invented in Germany, but everyone forgot about it because they had this little war. And Backhoffen reintroduced it. Backhoffen was a genius, but he was also sort of a social jerk. Okay, throw throw the manuscripts at the doctoral students, yell at them, curse out his contract monitors in Washington, and he wondered why he couldn't get any research money from them the next year. Anyway, um, but he's an interesting guy. Um, there's good stories about about Al, um, but we won't go through those now. So. <clears throat> If you didn't want to take, well, the three modules right now are Intro to Materials Processing and Casting, and then he'll, Simone will do Life Assessment, and I will do uh, Sheet Metal Forming Deformation Processing. And your assignment for this course, if we meet five days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, down there in uh, 4 145 at 9 o'clock. That's when we're supposed to have lectures. If we meet up here Tuesdays and Thursdays and we meet five days a week, you don't have a lot of reading. You can read these things I've handed out to you, but you know what? You're not going to be quizzed on them. You don't want to read them. You don't have to. Okay? In the meantime, you will have to do something because MIT requires that I do something to evaluate each student individually in the rules of the faculty. So you will have to give a presentation in this course. So the presentation, this is not very good focus today, is it? Um, the presentation, and you, this is your first assignment, is you have to hand this paper back in. You can scan it and email it to us if you want. You got to tell us w about a part that you're going to make a presentation on. We're going to have two presentations a day. So the first half of the term, you're going to come every day and you're going to see Tom Eager or Simone Belmar, or you're going to watch a video. This week, I'll tell you the schedule. We know our schedule this week. I'm, I'm giving intro to the whole course today. Tomorrow, Dr. Belmar is going to start the first lecture on life assessment. Wednesday, you're going to watch the intro lecture. The intro lecture is last summer. I'm starting to t supposed to talk about casting, and I thought, well, everything I ever talk about now is nanotech. Everybody talks about now is nanotechnology. How many people in materials are working on nanotechnology? Nano something. Nobody. Maybe that's why. But how many of your colleagues are? Eighty percent of them, right? I went to review 24 NSF proposals a couple of years ago, and my comment at the end of the day was, at least I learned how to spell nano uh, by reading these 24 proposals. Okay. Um, I am a little cynical. Anyway, Friday, so on, on Thursday you'll get the intro. The intro lecture, I will tell you why, from basic physics, kinetic theory of gases, people start to make structural materials with castings from liquid metal and not from the vapor phase. And the real reason is when you cast something, you can process it at least 100 million times faster than if you produce it from the vapor phase. In the vapor phase, you can grow something at about, if you're lucky, a millimeter an hour. Well, how many people would like to build a bridge across the Charles 
by building up the steel at a millimeter an hour. Mm, really good idea. And a price of $10,000 a pound. Okay? So who wants to pay $10,000 a pound to rebuild the Mass Ave Bridge? Mm. So guess what? They use steel. Okay? There's a reason for it. And if you took the material selection lecture, you'd get part of that. But in any case, you'll get part of it because when I talk about casting, I could take you back to steel mills. Okay? When I was a student, they taught steel mills. My first job as a TA in graduate school, which was my second term senior year, I was a TA for a course taught with Tom King, former department head, who was a blast furnace metallurgist. Okay? Came out of Scotland, the University of Strath Strathclyde. And Keith Johnson, who was a quantum mechanics ab initio type modeler guy before all the other ab initio modelers. This materials chemistry senior course, we went from blast furnace chemistry to quantum mechanics, all in one course. Broadest course you've ever seen. And I was the TA for that, okay? Nowhere but MIT would you include blast furnaces and quantum mechanics in the same course, but we did. That's the, way, that's the beauty of the modular method of teaching. Okay, so we're doing the modular method. I would propose that most of you should take introduction and listen to my introduction about why nanotechnology is great for functional materials but not so great for structural materials. And then it'll go through and talk about different casting technologies and how do you might make a class ring. is a big class ring. but. How can you make something with a lot of detail? Like this, if, this, if the Patriots had won the Super Bowl, they would have gotten a Super Bowl ring. Now the Giants get one. Those will be produced this summer down in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Okay? They may have to design them first, but they will be produced by lost wax casting. Okay? Um, so Friday, Dr. Bel I, I have to go see the eye doctor, so Dr. Belmar is going to lecture Wednesday and Thursday, Wednesday and Friday. Next week, I will probably take, initially, I'll probably take Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week, and he will take Thursdays and Fridays in this room. So, at least that's what we know for the next two weeks in schedule. Any questions on schedule? Just come every day. Forget whether it's recitation or lecture. It's going to be one of us, or it's going to be Jeremy showing you a video. Okay? We didn't find out. I guess you're going to have to use a computer with this thing. Probably. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. If we're interested in taking one of our pre recorded modules instead of a live one, you're one welcome one. to do that. And you just come talk to my secretary, Jerry Hill. And so if you're interested, for example, which you may be, in fact, I got your email and sent you an email. So if you were interested in one of these, you can do that. And in fact, if you're interested in three of these four, and you, you wouldn't even have to come to class. You don't have to listen to me rant and rave. Well, at least not live. Okay, you have to do it. Watch me rant, rant and rave on video. Okay, so you can get credit for the course by taking three modules. Any your choice. Okay, my suggestion, since if it's live, you can interrupt me and ask questions. And I actually do want you to interrupt and ask questions, because the because I would much rather digress and tell a story based on your question then go through whatever mess I was prepared to talk about, okay? And you'll get to see that as you see me lecture, okay? Uh, because we don't care about... You're not going to be quizzed on any of this stuff. Anyway, so the requirement is you must tell us whether you're going to emphasize a production methodology for making a part, or you're going to do a life assessment for a part, or you're going to actually do both. You're going to pick a physical object. Well, what do we mean by a physical object? Well, you could pick uh, a wedding ring or just a circular ring, but a simple ring. You could take a complex class ring, but I would suggest you keep things fairly simple. But you're going to have to tell me if I talk about a wedding ring, let's say, it's a simple band, what are the potential materials of construction for a wedding ring? Come on. Some of you have them. What are they made out of? Silver, platinum, gold. Silver, platinum, gold. Sometimes steel. Sometimes steel, in the worst case. My middle son has a titanium wedding band. 
okay? We could talk about why titanium is good or bad for wedding bands. Other ideas? In some societies, all they can afford is a steel band, okay? Now, if you're gonna make a million steel bands, and they don't have to be wedding rings, I know uh, an organization that for seven-year-olds gives out a little ring, and it has a CTR on it, which means choose the right, and you try to tell the, the children that, you know, teach them that they're supposed to choose the right rather than choose the wrong, okay? You don't tell that to people your age because you say, oh, duh. Okay, well then that, why do you choose the wrong sometimes? Um, nonetheless, um, that's another philosophical thing. But seven-year-olds, you can teach them to choose the right. And so they want to make these things. They want to make them inexpensively. And it has this little embossing on it. But they, they make it as a strip. And they just wrap it. Each child can wrap it around their finger. It's soft enough. And so they don't have to size it. Self-sizing. So you can take, you could take something like a simple ring, but you gotta tell me, you get to pick what it is. And you can pick it out of your own experience. You work on a nuclear reactor, you're gonna make a valve. No, that's a little, probably a little too complex. But nonetheless, take something simple, like a washer that goes in a nuclear reactor or something, okay? And how would you make it? And what material you're gonna make it out of? You should know this, you should pick your object. If you have a problem, you can come see me. Make an appointment, come by and see me. I'm usually in by seven o'clock in the morning. Don't get a lot of students coming at seven. But anyway, um, figure out what materials. If you were gonna do wedding bands, you might say, okay, I'm gonna look at the whole gamut from steel to copper to brass to titanium to silver to copper to gold. Anybody know what, just like we talked about the price, different, or price differential of a pound of weight in a car is $2 and a, space, a spacecraft is 20,000? Anybody know what the approximate ratio of the cost of a pound of silver to a pound of copper is? It's about 100, same type of ratio. Anybody know what the ratio of silver to gold is, approximately? In cost per pound? It's about a factor of 100, which means gold typically costs 10,000 10, times the price of copper, okay? So there's a difference between gold bands and silver bands and titanium bands, okay, as far as that goes. And now people use platinum. Uh, and it turns out um, when you get to this $10,000, or not $10,000, but a price, uh, and actually a pound of platinum or gold is closer to fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a pound because it's what a thousand dollars an ounce fifteen hundred dollars an ounce somewhere in there fifteen times fifteen is twenty two thousand you know five hundred okay when you get to that it's sort of a whole different manufacturing game um, we've been working I worked for about ten or fifteen years with the largest manufacturer of gold jewelry in the world down here in Attleboro they go through seven tons of gold every year they cast it and they form it and they shape it. And you're gonna hear some of my stories that come out of that plant. Well, they had an inventory shortfall once and so in the, in the early 90s and so I, my consulting project died with them. But just recently, another company down in that area, which is the second largest jeweler in the world, came and said, we wanna do some work with MIT. And I went through their plant two weeks ago and they make a lot of platinum rings. You know how they make a platinum wedding ring? They start out with a platinum tube, a thick walled platinum tube, and they slice it, and they take those slices and they put them in an automatic screw machine, and they turn them down to make little circular platinum bands. Well, they used to be cutting them mechanically in that lathe, and they had a kerf that was about eight tenths of a millimeter, 32 thousandths, a, 30, a 30 second of an inch. A kerf is the width of the cut. Well, that's a lot of scrap when you're dealing with platinum. Because it turns out, in that industry, and I learned this 30 some years ago, it, the cost of processing is insignificant to the carrying cost of the interest charge on the product you're putting out the door. And getting that product out the door from the gold bullion or the platinum bar that comes in and getting it out as a finished product, if you want to do that within 48 hours, not within two weeks, you want to do it in two days. And you don't care what it costs to process it. 
And that's a little different than most industries. But the value of the product at $22,000 a pound as the raw material cost, you need to get it out of there quickly. So they switched and they came in with a high power laser and they take these tubes and they slice them up with a high power laser. I mean, it's a three or four million dollar laser. Payback was two months, okay? Now they catch the vapor, the platinum vapor, and they recycle that. But the kerf is one quarter as much. They save three quarters of the kerf and they paid for a multi-million dollar machine in two months, okay? So production volume, materials of construction, interacts, production volume. If I'm gonna make wedding bands, I could make a million at a time, or I could make one that's unique. I made my wife's engagement ring. I electron beam melted it over the fourth floor of building eight with a uh, old radar power supply. Almost electrocuted myself, that's another story. Okay, <laughs> my wife didn't know that until after we were married. But nonetheless, I electron beam melted out of platinum iridium, okay? telling this story earlier this morning and Mike Tarkanian he made layers of sterling silver and silver diffusion bonded them or laminated them together in the furnace rolled it and twisted it and then machined part of it and made his wedding band okay so there's different ways to do it ours are unique one of a kind you know wedding bands simple objects now there are other simple objects Let's say instead of how you're gonna make it, you wanna talk about the life assessment. Maybe you wanna take something like a hammer. Well, there's a question of materials of construction. You wanna have a head that is hard so it can drive a nail, but you don't want it so hard that it's brittle and it doesn't bend if you overload it for some reason. You might wanna make it out of a copper alloy. Anybody know why they use tools made out of copper alloys, beryllium copper specifically, because it's the hardest copper alloy, about 200,000 yield, uh, PSI yield. Anybody know where they use? There's non one industry, pardon me? Non-sparking, exactly, what industry? Coal mining, where you're surrounded by methane gas. And the last thing you want is someone to hit the shovel, shovel against something and have steel against steel and a spark and everybody goes boom down the bottom of the mine. All the tools in a coal mine are going to be beryllium copper. So you can make them out of plastic handles. I went over to the lab to get this and what did I find out of the toolbox? This one's defective. And it's not going back to the toolbox. Someone should have thrown this one out. The plastic has cracked. Okay, But other than that it was fine. Okay, High mass up here, plastic, anyway. But you can do a life assessment, okay? You can look at the failure modes effects analysis, okay? So you'll be learning things. If you're interested in structural life assessment, you ought to pick a product, something simple like a hammer. Or that, don't, don't pick an automobile, because you can't do a 15 minute presentation, which is what you're gonna have to do. After spring break, we're going to schedule two students a day. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? You should sign up. There's two of these sheets. So I know who's going to be here. Okay. Um, pick a simple topic. A very simple thing, like a, like a simple ring. But it can, be all, it can be anything you want. Or it can be something simple like a hammer. Or a garden rake, I don't care. Take something simple, because you're going to find as you get into it, it's more complex than you think right now, okay? So by February 29th, pick something, fill out this sheet, sign it, give it to us. We'll approve it or not approve it. I probably won't approve it if you tell me you're gonna build a space shuttle, okay? Um, a little complex. Um, but I would encourage you to keep it simple, okay? And then you're gonna have a whole month or six weeks to come up with a 10 or 15 minute, minute presentation. It can be in PowerPoint. I can tell you what I think about the evils of PowerPoint. Uh, I have a nice article that gives you the Gettysburg Address using AutoCAD or Auto Content Wizard in PowerPoint. You can take one of the great pieces of English literature and turn it into pure pap with, with uh, Auto Content Wizard in PowerPoint. Properly used, PowerPoint's just fine. 
Okay? Improperly used, it's a joke. Okay? But anyway, anybody have any questions? I've been rambling about a number of things. And you did hear a couple of stories. You'll hear more stories in most cases. Okay? But you have to decide, just like Matthew, right? Uh, you have to decide which three modules you want to take. My suggestion for the average person here is to take this video, listen to the structural life with your fatigue, fracture, fracture mechanics, to give you a little idea of uh, Dr. Belmar reviewed this, at my suggestion, this book on structural life assessment. It's written by a guy from the aerospace industry in Southern California. So it, as he says, it has an aerospace type of bent. But fundamentals of fracture mechanics, fracture phenomena, fatigue crack, life assessment and improvement methods. It's really a damage tolerance. If you're in the nuclear business, you ought to know some of this stuff, okay? What size flaws are harmful, okay? And then environmentally assisted crack growth, well, corrosion, fracture mechanics, and application. So he's not going to be teaching directly from this book, like I'll be sort of doing from Hossford, but he will be covering fatigue and fracture of materials and why um, imperfections control the strength of materials. Anyone ever heard that buckyballs and nanographene and stuff are super strong? Okay? Absolute garbage. A physicist pipe dream is what it is. Um, I can take a sheet of paper. You'll see me doing this on the History Channel when I talk about the Titanic. Okay? And I can pull on that piece of paper with pounds of force. But if I put a flaw in that, it takes ounces. Okay? The inherent strength of a material may be millions of PSI. And you can do the calculation. I do it in the joining lectures. Okay? I hand that out and tell you how to calculate that you know, a carbon nanotube should have two or three million PSI strength. That's only true if you don't have a vacancy. If you have an atomic vacancy, then it's just like having a defect. And if you really made a real carbon nanotube, it would fail at one-tenth the theoretical strength. And in fact, we've known that for 50 years. The physicists didn't know it because they were so they were 50 years behind the material scientists. In fact, actually, they're still more than 50 years behind the material scientists. We grew iron whiskers in the 1950s that were a single crystal, all but a screw dislocation up the axis. And they pulled those, and they got 2 million psi strength as an experimental strength. Because if you don't have any mobile dislocations, you pull on a screw dislocation parallel with the, the axis of the screw, screw dislocation, it won't move. So it was like pulling a perfect crystal. And they got 2 million PSI strength for steel. We don't have steels at, at 2 million PSI. But the physicists are out there telling Congress and everybody else in the world that they've discovered carbon nanotubes that will allow us to build the, the rope chain to the moon. You've heard about that, haven't you? Okay, some of you are saying yes. But they say that they can do those carbon nanotubes. You know what? I'm going to let Jack climb that beanstalk first, okay, before I do. Because I know that if you have a vacancy, and if you're a material scientist, you know that at any temperature above absolute zero, you will have vacancies in the material. You can prove that. Second law of thermodynamics. You will have a mixture of atoms and vacancies at any temperature above absolute zero. So the physicists are getting billions of dollars to study carbon nanotubes, and it's just money down a rat hole. But they might be good for display technologies and other things, functional materials. But structural materials, don't invest. OK. Thanks. Any questions? Oh. In the future, I want you to stop me and ask questions.